Dear friends, this Saturday, I'm here to bring you another episode of my Saturday Wisdom. Today, I will share with you the cyber challenge and explore some important aspects to understand what cyber security and safety is. A quote by Jane Adams, a pioneer American settlement activist, reformer and social worker is worth remembering while we discuss security. The good we secure for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secured for all of us and incorporated into our common life. Matthew Broderick created war games and hacking for fun way back in 1983. Those days are over. Hacking is now a real and a billion dollar business. More than 50% of the world's population is now online. Roughly 1 million more people join the internet each day. Two thirds of humanity own a mobile device. The fourth industrial revolution for IR technologies are bringing massive economic and societal benefits to a large part of the global population. The next wave of four IR technologies will dramatically reshape our economics and our societies. Precision medicine, autonomous vehicles and drones are all fast growing markets while artificial intelligence AI alone is expected to boost global growth by 14 percent by 2030. Hackers typically go after companies with fewer than 100 employees. The World Economic Forum's 2020 Global Risks Report estimates that cyber attacks on critical infrastructure is rated the fifth top risk in 2020. A new normal seems to be drawing across sectors such as energy, healthcare and transportation. The report further states that such attacks have even affected entire cities. The leading cybersecurity firm McAfee revealed that the growing cyber crime incidents now cost the world economy more than one trillion dollars or just more than one percent of the global GDP which is up more than 50 percent from 2018 that put global losses at close to 600 billion dollars. Indeed massive. One of the earliest and biggest cyber threats was started by the Melissa virus in 1999. The virus caused severe destruction to hundreds of companies including Microsoft. It is estimated that repairing the affected systems costed around 80 million dollars. In the same year, NASA's computers were hacked and shut down for 21 days. Around 1.7 million software were downloaded during the attack, which cost the space giant 
around $41,000 in repairs, not to speak of the credibility of the systems. A cyber attack on Sony's PlayStation network in April 2011 claimed the personal information of 77 million users. This is a breach. In 2014, Yahoo witnessed one of the biggest cyber attacks of the year when 500 million accounts were compromised. Even power grids were hacked in Ukraine, sending many homes powerless. One of the biggest ransomwares of all time took place in 2017, when around 2 lakh computers were affected in more than 150 countries. This outbreak had a global cost of about 6 billion pounds. In recent times, hacking of the National Bank of Bangladesh for a 100 million was a very sophisticated operation, 100 million dollars. Wanna cry, not petia, and not designed to make money. They are all still fresh in our memory. Happened as they were in our country. Let's get some information on cyber hacks. IC3's report found that phishing, including wishing, smishing, and farming, were the most prevalent threats worldwide in 2020. More than 2 lakh victims were there in US alone, not to speak of the other countries. This was followed by non-payment, non-delivery extortion, personal data breach and identity thefts. Euro grabber scam in Europe back in 2012, a decade earlier, was a Sandroid botnet, which intercepted around 28,000 text messages or OTPs as we know them, of customers at Middle East financial institutions. Operation Emmental, an attack at Trend Micro in July 2014, affected over 30 banks in Austria, Switzerland, Germany, Sweden, and Japan, where presumably millions were stolen from both consumer and commercial bank accounts. The attack demonstrated that hackers are upping their game and devising new advanced ways to defeat SMS OTPs. The threat looms over organizations of every stripe, every size, private and public, in every corner of the globe. In September 2017, the news broke that a consumer credit reporting agency, Equifax, had suffered a catastrophic breach the preceding May. <coughs> Hackers or identity thieves gained access to the personal data of nearly 150 million citizens in the US, roughly two thirds of the country's population including full names, social security numbers, addresses, and dates of birth. The swiftly unfolding scandal sent the company's stocks plummeting 33%, a market value loss of approximately $10 billion. So we must be aware of what cyber attacks can do and how they must be mitigated. It was in 2017 that the UIDAI in India asserted, Aadhaar data is fully safe. 
and secure. And there has been no data leak or breach amongst reports, reports of breach. They claimed the same on 3rd January the next year as well when it took just 500 rupees paid through Paytm and 10 minutes in which an agent of the group running the racket created a gateway and gave a login ID and password. It appeared one could enter the Aadhaar number in the portal and instantly get all the particulars that an individual may have submitted to the UIDAI, including name, address, postal code, or PIN as we know, photo, phone number, and email. Similar to what happened in the US. People are very innovative, disruptive, unstructured, and technology savvy, way ahead of structured developers that governments depend on. Hence, data theft, sometimes through hacking and sometimes by exploiting breaches in the last mile or anywhere in the operational supply chain is always a possibility. For anyone to claim foolproof systems is probably a myth. Let alone UIDAI. One can only build more and more layers of security. In a bid to address privacy concerns, the UIDAI introduced a new concept of virtual ID, which by which the holder can generate differently every time he logs in from a website and use for various purposes, including SIM verification, instead of sharing the actual 12-digit biometric ID. This will give the users the option of not sharing their Aadhaar number at the time of authentication. A good initiative. This is akin to one-time password or OTP, which you receive via SMS from your bank to your mobile phone every time you log in or transfer money from your online account without revealing the account number. Though virtual ID is also vulnerable to phishing, it involves more steps before a hacking can happen. But it's a commendable job on the part of UIDAI, authorities and the government. However, it must be noted that the new kids on the block are technology savvy and extremely motivated. That's a very dangerous combination. Security policy, regulatory compliance, user awareness programs, access control, security audit, incident response, encryption, firewall, and finally antivirus are all important aspects of security and are highly technical in nature. Learning training and retraining on a regular basis therefore becomes mandatory. Governments have to work over time to make the nation safer than it was in the days preceding, especially after the global terror attacks. Cybersecurity remains a cross-cutting thread across every other infrastructure and is the underlying foundation for the operation of every business and government function. Unlike physical vulnerabilities, 
cyber security vulnerabilities and threats can change in seconds. The protective measures can also become obsolete just as quickly. The Indian government for whom cyber safety is paramount through the Cyber and Information Security C and IS division under the Ministry of Home Affairs keeps our cyberspace safe. The government of India has a cyber security response system, a security threat and vulnerability reduction program and a security awareness and training program. They are all there in place. All these ensure government cyberspace leading the country to embark on an effective international cyberspace security cooperation model. India is also in the final stages of clearing national cyber security strategy. A lot is done and a lot is being done. However, a good initiative would be to create a registry of cyber security experts at operational level, at the ground level. The cyber security program divided in four levels would create trained professionals at each level accredited with either a white belt, blue belt, green belt or a black belt. A 240 hour training at each level with real time hands on learning would populate the registry. A registry would keep tabs on the trained personnel since today's experts could easily become tomorrow's hackers in an ever expanding and innovative world. Such a registry can then be used to depute to address different classes of vulnerabilities and intrusions simultaneously populating the experts database vulnerabilities and the security solutions offered. Besides creating a pool of experts for our country and other countries as well, a registry of security breaches and troubleshoots would be available which will help in research into future breaches, thus spinning off several new job opportunities not to speak of the immense benefits accruing like predicting future attacks. We need to be one step ahead of the attackers. That may be difficult, but that's what is required while mitigating cyber security threats. The past of cyber security was young and immature. The attackers were more innovative than the defenders who were mired in FUD syndrome, five fear, uncertainty and doubt syndrome. Attack back was illegal or classified. Currently, cyber security is a scientific discipline is application and technology centric with a complete understanding that cyber security will never be solved but will only be mitigated. Further, attack back is now an integral part of cyber security. If I am attacked, I will attack back. Further, attack back is an integral part of the cyber security. Remember, attackers have sizable inventory of known but unused or rarely used tricks and are highly innovative. It is imperative 
that appropriate programs in cyber security and safety are designed and conducted in our universities as well. Further, the new strategy must look at present security initiatives as business cases. The cost of poor security must be measurable by not providing adequate security, there is a opportunity lost cost that must be factored. Large policy changes must be supported with a robust targeted communications plan supporting services and documentation, patch management, communications, Incentives and mass communications must be shared with the private sector, including owners and operators of the critical information infrastructure. Improving performance on cyber risk assessments and remediation activities must include a plan for internet related recovery in the event of a disaster or coordinated attack and work closely with cyber first responders from the registry that I talked about across the nation, state, local and private sectors. Finally, the strategy must also support research and development and educational activities to improve cyber security products and services that are user friendly and keep pace with risk and technology. There is a lot that the country can do in this space, creating new job opportunities along the way. A cyber security knowledge database and an expert system that promotes alerts on possible cyber crime threats based on heuristics, statistical models are all imperative. That may be a part of the research methodology that we use eventually, but it is a must. So friends, as I come to the end of this episode, I find that a security debate would probably not end without remembering what Benjamin Franklin, one of the founding fathers of the United States said on liberty. Those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Thank you, Namaskar and Dhanivad. Until we meet the next Saturday with yet another episode of Saturday Wisdom. Until then, keep safe and keep healthy.